Welcome to the weekly series of Caring Conversations, Empowering Lives for Cancer Care. In this series of events, we come together along with eminent experts in the field to discuss and empower cancer patients as they fight their battle against the disease. In today's event, we will learn about a breakthrough discovery that enables quick and accurate detection of oral cancers using a handheld biosensor. Then we will hear from our distinguished guest, Dr. Nikhil Nagraj, about the various treatment modalities for oral cancer patients in need of surgery and the need for a multidisciplinary treatment approach. He is a cancer survivor himself, and we would have a quick discussion with him regarding his journey. We would encourage you to ask questions to our experts by typing them in the comment section. We will take them up at the end of the session. Let's begin with today's session of Beat Cancer Facts. Since oral cancer occurs in one of the most accessible sites of the body, it is easily treated if it can be detected promptly at the earlier st stage. It is the 13th most common type of cancers globally and oral squamous cell carcinoma, which is one of the type of oral cancer, accounts for more than 90% of oral cancer cases. If caught early in the disease state, these cancers remain localized, that is within the uh, mouth itself and do not metastasize. And these are usually small, two centimeters in size and therefore can be cured. The five-year survival rate exceeds more than 90%. So it is very important that it is detected, the symptoms are taken into consideration and then the treatment is done as early as possible. In a recently reported research in the Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology B, researchers from the University of Florida and National Yang Ming Chao Tung University in Taiwan report a breakthrough handheld biosensor that enables quick and accurate detection of oral cancer. So these are still in the research stage, but it has got a very good accuracy and quick detection method, which can be useful for the oral cancer patients. Ming and Jian, co-author and a researcher at the University of Florida said that, quotes, it requires early detection via various medical technologies to improve the survival rate. While most detection techniques for oral squamous cancer cells requires histological testing in a lab to confirm the presence of cancer and the cancer type, it is important to have a point of care detection technique that can be used on site and for a quick result use readout. So this group's biosensor, it consists of a sensor strip, which is similar to a glucose strip. And it also has a circuit board, which can be uh, something like a handheld terminal, like a glucometer has. So this strip and the circuit board works together and helps in the detection of the oral squamous cell cancer. The team is now looking forward to demonstrate this integrated solution for cancer and also other diseases via the handheld device which can be used as point of care device. Like I said, uh, when there are patients on site and a quick det uh, detection is needed so that it can detect over uh, a short period and also at very low levels. They also hope that this work will inspire further research in the topic. Cancer success stories have similar such contributions from a wide variety of fields. Explorations and innovations in one field of research can lead to breakthrough treatments for cancer, either for treatment or for detection or management, cancer management in general. Today, we have with us Dr. Nikhil Nagraj, who will elaborate on the need for such multidisciplinary approaches for treating cancer. 
Dr. Nagraj is a specialist oral and maxillofacial surgeon having a decade of experience working with patients and families suffering from the effects of oral cancer. In the nine years that he was affiliated to the Craniofacial Surgery and Research Center, affiliated to SDM University in Dharwar, Karnataka in India, he was exposed to a wide spectrum of cancerous and precancerous diseases of the mouth. He is currently working for the Ministry of Health in Oman as a specialist maxillofacial surgeon. Welcome, doctor, to our event. Thank you. Thank you, Tapsi. At the outset, uh, people would be curious to know what is the role of an oral and maxillofacial surgeon for the treatment of cancer patients? Um, Dr. Tapsi, I would like to break this into uh, two different segments. One is, uh, you know, first thing is the diagnosing part. And second thing is the taking care part. So both of these go hand in hand and we as dentists and more specifically as oral surgeons have the unique opportunity to observe patients at the initial stage while they are suffering and while they are recovering. So we hold this unique position where we can see the entire journey of the patient. As a dentist, we would be the first point of contact for any lesion or any abnormality in the mouth. As a maxillofacial surgeon, I would be receiving most of the referrals from the general practitioners or general dentists for further management. And what do I do? I further am able to diagnose specifically what kind of cancer it is, what stage of cancer it is, and how much it has spread. And based on that, I can give the patient options as to how exactly they can go ahead and get the, patient, uh, get the disease treated. So whether it requires a tertiary care, whether it requires a multidisciplinary approach or whether it requires some amount of rehabilitation. I also get the opportunity to evaluate the quality of life that the patient leads after these kind of uh, diseases. So uh, uh, we may surmise that maybe you were the first point of uh, touch for the patient when they are not even uh, diagnosed with cancer, even you could have such cases, right? Uh, they could have yes. some symptoms. And yes, they may we, just... we have had, we have, in fact, I've had, I should not be saying funny, but somehow, uh, you know, kind of a deja vu kind of uh, experiences. I remember when I started off, I had one case where the patient had a ulcer in the oral cavity, which did not heal for two months. He was scared. He was scared that he has cancer and he did not come. Why was he scared? One thing was the very word cancer. Second thing, the social stigma. So these were the two things that held him from seeking professional advice. Finally, when the pain became unbearable, he reported to us. We did a biopsy. The disease was confirmed. He was operated. He was fine. This patient was 75 years old. As bad luck would have it, he had a son who was 35 years old who had an ulcer which was not resolving and he got this son of his to me uh, for a biopsy. He did not even think whether it is it can be some other reason for the ulcer or anything. He was just so scared. He wanted me to do a biopsy. So when I asked him, how long has this ulcer been there? He said it's been there just for a week. And then finally we realized he had actually bitten on his cheek and that had created an ulcer. So this is the kind of social stigma that cancer can create. Sometimes you lose the reasoning. You are just so paranoid. One more incident I would like to share here is in my, uh, in my third or fourth year of working in my uh, parent institution, uh, I got a patient who was 65 years old, confirmed case of biopsy, he was operated for, and he recovered well. He had a sister who had a similar lesion, who was so scared, but he convinced her to come. We did a biopsy. She was also diagnosed with cancer. They had a cousin brother who accompanied this patient, insisted that we do a biopsy on him as well as he himself had a, such a lesion. We did that, and that also turned out positive for cancer. So all the three brothers and sisters were diagnosed within a span of two months with having oral cancer. 
so these two examples show us that you know it is its prevalence it is very very common and most people are actually aware of it they just sometimes try to live in denial try to you know escape the reality the social stigma plays an important role in all of this but as you said in your introduction that this is one of the most accessible sites for evaluation so my message would be if you in doubt always consult it always consult whenever in doubt so and it didn't be a specialist oncologist like you said no, they can you go need to, to have a point of initial encounter with any general practitioner because the prevalence is so widespread almost everyone has had an encounter with some kind of cancer you go to the movies you get loads of photos of how oral cancer looks you ask any person who goes to the movies you see it on the cigarette packets you see it and uh, big holds you you see everywhere so it's not that people do not realize what oral cancer is so i would suggest any point of contact is fine if it can be diagnosed even if it is suspicious to seek specialist advice that's that's really important because sometimes we are just afraid that what the news would be and then we don't go for a diagnosis wait for longer than required and then maybe it's already too late to do something very true okay so are there any specialized oral and maxillofacial procedure surgical procedures that may be needed as part of treatment cancer treatment or recovery yes so oral cancer treatment can be again divided into first diagnosing second as treating and third as rehabilitating so mm -hmm. these three processes form the entire journey of surgical uh, the surgical journey for the patient why diagnosing is important is because we need to take a part of tissue which is affected in the oral cavity and subject it to something called as a histopathological examination so mm -hmm. here we have a um, new discipline called general pathologist or oral pathologist or maxillofacial pathologist who mm -hmm. come and review the cells which are seen under the microscope which show changes these changes are very very specific to cancer cells so we this is the first point where we have a multidisciplinary approach second is clearing the tumor itself so sometimes what happens the tumor is very small it can be removed in total with just a simple surgery under general anesthesia and then sometimes the tumor itself is there but then the tumor cells tend to spread within the neck because oral cavity cancer spread through the neck we have some channels called as lymphatic channels through which the oral cancer cells spread to other parts of the body mm -hmm. so we need to stop the spread of oral cancer so clearing these lymph node channels are very very important so this is where the role of a maxillofacial surgeon comes in we are responsible for resection of the cancer along with the channels through which it spreads mm -hmm. third is the rehabilitation so rehabilitation is where sometimes the tumor is so aggressive or it is so uh, it is so widely spread that it sometimes needs warranting of removal of a part of the jaw or whole of the jaw so that is where rehabilitation comes in so here we take a discipline multidisciplinary approach of having plastic surgeons with us general surgeons with us dentists implantologists all of them who are trying to give some kind of quality back into the patient's life after all this there is again the role of chemotherapy and radiotherapy so it's it's like a huge cycle which goes on and on and on and at the end of it all you just look at the patient and their relative and that's when the whole story actually comes out the ordeal that they go through and all because someone was just scared or living in denial of seeking professional advice early on in their disease process so removing this stigma is i think the first step in trying to improve the cancer care in uh, during our generation so yeah i think it's very important for a person to understand that they have to go through all of this if the first step does not work right so very again important. back to the same point uh, the sooner you get the treatment the better it is yes um, so yeah that's all that we can um, ask them to do but like you mentioned you also need to work with medical oncologists radiation yes. oncologists right yes. because surgery may not because be the only option because what happens with oral cancers because that is my area of uh, experience is once we remove the tumor 
we know how badly it is spread mm -hmm. what the patient sees and what the general practitioner sees is only from the outside you open them out what you can see is what you can judge we open up the whole face we know how deep it has penetrated we know how much of bone it has eaten into we know how much of vascular channels have been affected we know how many lymphatic channels have been affected all this go into grading the cancer so that is what we say stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 it is this is what determines what stage it is mm -hmm. secondly what happens is once they know what stage it was when it was removed then the medical oncologists can determine what is required post surgery whether they need radiotherapy chemotherapy what else brachytherapy so they then are able to decide what needs to be done further to prevent the recurrence or reemergence of cancer so this is where we deal with the multidisciplinary team approach with the medical background and of course when the patient is explained the treatment plan they already know that these are the processes that needs to be done i i i assume that it's explained to them yes all this has to be explained because it all comes with a cost every procedure the irony is that every patient who needs these treatments are most often they're not the ones who cannot actually afford it that is the irony and that remains the truth even today in spite of brilliant schemes that have been run uh, by the administration the benefit doesn't reach the person who actually needs it so we are at the cutting edge we we know what can be done we know how to diagnose we know how to treat we know how to gauge the quality of life but we are not able to reach the man who really needs it the most yeah understood and uh, yeah we we have been doing campaigns to raise awareness about oral cancer uh, both by the yeah. authority and uh, people yes, themselves yes because uh, april i think is the cancer awareness month if i'm not wrong then you go to any movie the first thing that you see is the story of cancer you pick up a pack of cigarette you have the gross photo of a person with oral cancer you have heard mm -hmm. stories of people losing their loved ones to cancer i don't think there's any family which has not had a brush with an experience mm -hmm. of cancer so it's not that people do not know what it is anymore it is just that you know it's a social stigma now it's people are not very comfortable sharing their experiences whereas i feel talking can in fact you know guide people into the right path because you now everyone has had their experiences with cancer everyone knows what it is everyone knows what are the consequences of it and even to this day if you are anywhere between stage 2 to stage 3 we still measure success of cancer surgery with 5 year survival rates that itself shows how dangerous it is and so, that is 90% if it is detected and treated early so people yes. should really yes so we still measure oral cancer survival with 5 year survival rates so that mm -hmm. itself shows and that's not the problem with the disease itself it is the problem that it recurs it can always come back and it comes back with vengeance so mm -hmm. having and oral cancer basically it comes with two things one is your habits one is your genetics and third is basically some viruses which have been implicated so knowing these things itself can tremendously bring down the burden of oral cancer in a community so i think we should uh, we should support the people who have been diagnosed with cancer and they should re be ready to accept these changes in their lifestyle which can go a long way in preventing the gross effects of cancer surgery mm -hmm. on their lives and Uh, on a different note doctor in your experience so if a patient cancer patient is undergoing radiation or chemotherapy not necessarily for oral cancer but can that lead to any specific oral complications or impact yes. on oral health yes yes so basically what happens is uh, if i can put it in layman terms uh, most of these kind of adjuvant treatments affect anything which is rapidly growing mm -hmm. or which rapidly multiplies so like our hair you would have seen most chemo patients they lose their hair the skin becomes very dry the oral cavity becomes very very dry so we take it for granted that our mouth is always moist but when you start taking chemotherapy or radiotherapy sessions it even kills the saliva producing cells so our uh, our oral cavity becomes very dry because it is dry 
the cleansing action of saliva doesn't happen on the teeth the patient start to develop a rampant dental decay then what happens is certain chemotherapeutic agents also prevent rapid renewal of or remodeling of bone so suppose some teeth has to be removed post or during the uh, during the chemotherapy or radiotherapy process healing becomes a big issue because there is no remodeling of bone so patients tend to lose bone more rapidly so leading to something called as osteomyelitis infection of the bone itself so thirdly you can uh, so what we as dentists can do is before and it's a staged protocol before starting any of these adjuvant uh, therapies the patient always makes a visit to the dental office a dental uh, a practitioner is well aware of the uh, every dental practitioner is well aware of the complications of chemo and radiotherapy it is uh, the jurisdiction of the dentist to decide whether any teeth requires treatment before the patient is subjected to chemo and radiotherapy so and this time frame between surgery and therapy should be as least as possible so what we usually believe is within 6 weeks so the patient the dentist gets a very limited time between the patient's recovery from uh, the surgery to clearing of any decay which can create a pro- potential problem during when the patient is uh, when the patient is uh, undergoing these kind of adjuvant therapies so mm-hmm. yes dentists do have a huge role to play during the progress of these adjuvant therapies so uh, if if a cancer patient has to take uh, chemotherapy radiation therapy as part of the treatment plan they should uh, have a good oral checkup first yes is always and it is not day it will be referred by the medical oncologist himself themselves okay. yes there is a protocol so the protocol suggests that there should not be any tooth which is liable for removal immediately or within 6 months any such mm-hmm. teeth which have a questionable survival rate need to be removed before the patient is subjected to uh, adjuvant therapies okay and is there any potential long term effect for these cancer treatments on oral yes. or facial health yes so cancer surgery is basically removal of abnormal tissue okay or abnormal part of the mouth now this can sometimes be what we uh, we used to learn is as composite removal that means that can sometimes involve removal of the skin removal of the uh, removal of the teeth as well as sometimes removal of the jaws so you can have sometimes huge disfiguring uh, defects of the face which can impact the life of a patient can impact the quality of life of a patient so yes mm-hmm. these uh, these have long term effects and also these uh, chemotherapeutic drugs they remain to be within the bone for a very very long time so the effects of these uh, slow remodeling of bone can persist for as long as 10 years so it is very very essential that we maintain uh, the patients who are uh, diagnosed with oral cancer maintain good oral hygiene practices maintain a very disciplined lifestyle they have had a brush with cancer they need to see that they do not facilitate its recurrence at any cost okay and uh, can you suggest any oral care tips for these kind of patients yes. to minimize yes. any so, uh, this is uh, something which everyone has to do you have to brush two times a day you have to get any uh, have a visit once every 3 months and there are something called as fluoride applications so fluoride applications technically prevent recurrence of tooth decay so especially in cancer patients th- they are more prone because of reduced saliva so we need to augment their oral hygiene practices make it more stringent for them insist on regular checkups and as and when a small decay is noted to prevent further uh, progression of the decay and the loss of tooth so i think prevention here is always better than cure in this particular case and what about dietary recommendations because we take food to yes. our mouth so, so this is where something called as uh, uh, pre malignant or pre cancerous lesions and conditions come into play so diet plays a very very important role so i would like to share one small experience here we all know the uh, that the korean pop culture is here to stay so i had a i had a patient uh, who was 14 years old son of another doctor who is big time into bts and big time into korean drama so now what has happened is he is starting eating uh, only korean food now mm-hmm. korean food is spicy very spicy and he has developed white 
stripes on his inner gums which scared his father is also a doctor so when we did a biopsy we realized that there are certain changes that are beginning to show within the mouth so this is still a pre cancerous lesion that is the the gingiva in that particular area is showing some changes so in this stage when you prevent or when you stop uh, the insult usually the mucosa or the gums revert back to the normal stage this is analogous to the skin on the feet and the hand the hand skin is very soft and the feet skin is a little tough because it is exposed to more uh, work you know we put the entire weight of the body on the feet and walk similarly when you when there is a constant insult on the gums or on the oral mucosa it tends to change in the initial stages when the insult stops the process usually reverses reverses back but when you continue to the insult that is in the form of either tobacco very spicy food alcohol smokeless tobacco betel quid all this tends to make the mucosa harder after a certain point in time there are certain uh, certain uh, receptors within the body which stop the control they just stop functioning they realize this man is not going to stop and then they start to produce a protective mechanism so that is when the gums or the oral mucosa becomes thicker and thicker trying to prevent the insult this is the process where we call as keratosis the mucosa tries to become stronger after a certain point this multiplication which is under control loses control so when from normal mucosa to an altered mucosa the body loses control it is called as malignancy so this is where this is what cancer is all about so yes diet has a very very important role to play so don't have very spicy food uh, have a disciplined lifestyle stay away from tobacco especially smokeless tobacco i am not promoting smoking tobacco but stay away especially from smokeless tobacco alcohol always has a uh, cumulative effect so yeah try to have a disciplined lifestyle have uh, have a, and keep away from these uh, substances i think this is this is the message i would like to pass on yeah very important to note i think uh, most of us are again Uh, aware of these things but we tend to forget at times but yeah it's good to be reminded of uh, having a disciplined lifestyle in general yes. uh, so doctor uh, like i had mentioned before um, so you are a cancer survivor yourself right so if if possible would you like to share your um, thoughts that maybe yes. because you are more aware of the symptoms you yes, being... i was more aware and i made all the mistakes that i told i should not i should, that you should not do initially i was in denial i had a small lump in the neck i was in denial i was thinking it is something relating to cough or tonsils or just lymph node secondary to some infection i told my wife she said what's wrong with you you should have got it checked i still pushed it further and then uh, finally when i got it checked uh, i was greeted to the news that yes it is it is cancer but the funny thing that my doctor told is i i am a survivor of uh, thyroid cancer and he said you have the best cancers to have because here survival rates are not measured in 5 years it is we don't measure it at all it is usually pretty non recurrent so i was lucky that way uh, i was lucky that way and th- this is the thing there are no known causes for thyroid cancer but uh, radiation in any form is always dangerous so we what we call as ionizing radiations can always trigger some not just for thyroid cancer even for no oral cancer you know so mm-hmm. all these ionizing radiations have a certain potential for uh, changing a normal cell into a malignant cell so we don't know what the cause was but yes we caught it early definitely me being in the field helped i, I had access to the latest uh, investigative procedures and everything was done my investigations got completed within 3 days i got a biopsy done i got a ct done and i had an mri done in 3 days which is unheard of so i was just lucky to be in the right place at the right time and i was under very good care i was given the best care possible because i was treated by my own staff so he was under tremendous pressure to treat me so but yes yes uh, it is an ordeal it is an ordeal for the family it is an ordeal for everyone who was related to me who knew me uh, we all went through it and uh, yes that is what pulled me through more than the medicines and the surgery i think the empathy and the 
and the support of people is what got me through so i think that is i think uh, a lesson for everyone that you need to share you need to know the problem because you never know where help comes from somebody would have had an experience who can guide you in the right way uh, i would like to share one more small experience here we we had a patient uh, 38 year old uh, farmer who had a chronic lesion on the tongue he went to a local practitioner who was what we term as quacks the he was dispensing medicines to be applied on the lesion when we saw the label it said scorpion poison so their mentality was if it can kill a scorpion it can kill a cell so so it's it's something which is very prevalent it's very prevalent in the rural areas where we were practicing they are they are surrounded by false messages they are surrounded by many messages which may not cater to the current needs of the patient so seeking professional help and breaking the social stigma i think should be at the forefront of cancer treatment everything else is uh, de- depends upon the patient's uh, accessibility but if you do not know what you have you cannot treat uh, what you may have that's that's very important and that is why maybe we are still working on the awareness part because even though we reach uh, a lot of people the social stigma is still there i think it's true for even cancer survivors i have heard uh, them say that we don't want to share that we have cancer or we had cancer so i think yeah like you said uh, the more people you reach out to the more help you may get uh, some may be solicited some unsolicited but still help is always out there and i can see one question from the audience doctor they say that how long will oral cancer treatment last is there any uh, specific time frame that you have in mind everything depends upon the first point of contact and everything depends upon at what stage the disease is detected mm-hmm. if it's a very small lesion i i uh, i have another experience here i i have a very close friend of mine dr jawahar who came across a patient who had a small ulcer on the tongue so we were all just starting our careers and being the enthusiastic guy he is he removed the whole lesion suture uh, play stitches and sent off the patient when we saw the final report it was a very very aggressive tumor that he removed on the dental chair under local anesthesia and the miracle was there was no residual lesion there at all a patient who walked in with a potentially very serious malignancy walked out of a dental chair within 45 minutes with being absolutely disease free on the other hand if you come to at a very late stage then the uh, then the treatment and the survival everything becomes questionable everything becomes questionable so it's it's a time frame can be so i would i uh, like to send this message across is uh, time frame depends on the early detection early detection always has a better prognosis no matter how serious the cancer is so uh, yes we we learn from our patients we learn from their relatives our experience grows as we share so i think early detection will definitely determine how long the treatment lasts so this was a really interesting conversation doctor and i think we are already beyond our time limit but thanks so much for sharing your expertise sharing these success stories and also what all can be done uh, to actually take note of this uh, type of cancer which is easy to treat if detected early so we really appreciate your time and your valuable contribution for today's event thank you thanks So with this we come to an end to today's event thank you all for taking part in this engaging session we look forward to seeing you again next week when we will discuss another important aspect that affect a cancer patient's life thank you see you take care